so that from being nothing, and there are no pictures before Graves' remarks are published, Grasmere becomes a, a central icon in the thinking of the Lake District, always a paradise. Um, this is going to be taken up by the artists, and from this point onwards, you get, for instance, Farrington, who became secretary of the Royal Academy. He did one drawing which was based upon Gray's description. But when he's read West, he transforms or takes a new position and puts Helmcrag behind, and that's what he publishes with a text, interestingly enough, written by Wordsworth's uncle, William Cookson. So Wordsworth is brought up in a household where they are actually dealing with uh, concepts of landscape. Wordsworth later in life recorded how this attitude to the prospect was a new fashion in his youth. In my youth, I lived sometime in the Vale of Keswick, under the roof of a shrewd and sensible woman, who more than once exclaimed in my hearing, Bless me, folks are always talking about prospects. When I was young, I was never sick of being named. Wordsworth was born at Cockermouth beside the River Derwent. He was educated with his brothers Richard, John and Christopher at Hawkshead Grammar School and then went on to Cambridge where he paid very little attention to the mathematical books that he was supposed to be studying. In the years 1790 to 92 he twice visited France, falling in love with the ideals of the French Revolution and falling in love also with a young French woman named Annette Vallon. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Wordsworth is looking back in the prelude to the period of the French Revolution, when as an undergraduate at St John's College, Cambridge, he had crossed to France on the eve of the anniversary of the fall of the Bastille. The country was rejoicing. A year later, he returned to France and met there two people who were immensely important to his life. The first of them was Michel Beaupuy, a French aristocrat, but also a Republican, who converted Wordsworth to a belief in the people and the revolution. As he said, his heart was all given to the people. His heart was also given in a rather different way to Annette Vallon, a young French woman by whom before the end of the year, he had a child, christened in Orleans Cathedral as Anne Caroline Wordsworth. By that stage, the poet was on his way back to England, intent on raising money to marry Annette. In France, though, his friends, the Girondins, the moderate party, were losing power. Robespierre took control. The reign of terror ensued in which thousands of people were sent to the guillotine. At the end of July 1794, however, Robespierre himself lost power and the next day was guillotined. Wordsworth heard the news as he was crossing Morecambe Sands. All the plain was spotted with a variegated crowd of coaches, wains and travellers, horse and foot, wading beneath the conduct of their guide in loose procession through the shallow stream of inland water. The great sea, meanwhile, was at safe distance, far retired. I paused, unwilling to proceed. The scene appeared so gay and cheerful. When a traveller chancing to pass, I carelessly inquired if any news was stirring. He replied in the familiar language of the day that Robespierre was dead. Wordsworth during the 1790s turned gradually from politics to poetry. The process was eased by companionship with his sister Dorothy, but something of the kind was experienced by Coleridge too. The two poets met in September 1795, and in 1797 to 8, they were reunited at Orfoxton in Somerset, where they wrote jointly the great poetry of lyrical ballads, including Coleridge's Ancient Mariner, Wordsworth's Thorn, Idiot Boy, and Tintin Abbey. If Michael is the poem that embodies the Wordsworthian values, the rootedness in place, then the archetypal Coleridge poem must be the Ancient Mariner. It was written in 1797 to 8, when Wordsworth and Coleridge and Dorothy 
were in Somerset. It is a poem, though, of the purest imagination. <laughs>